Welcome. Uh, this is April 3rd, and we are going through calculus today. Um, so what we have in front of us is a warm-up. So we have two questions that have to do with logarithms. And on, uh, on Wednesday, we introduced the derivative of natural log. Uh, we saw the rule for that. Um, so we had natural log over here. And then we also have um, this other logarithm here, log base 3. Um, that we're going to deal with uh, as well. So uh, throughout the course of the day today, what we're going to do is we're going to we'll warm up with some logarithms here, and then we're going to continue to think a little bit more about inverse functions, and specifically we're going to look at uh, inverse trigonometric functions, the inverse sine, which we call arc sine, and then the inverse tangent, which we call arc tangent. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so everybody that's, that's here right now, so we've got about nine people, so um, we're gonna give everybody a minute to think through these uh, examples. And so um, I'll go ahead and, and start thinking about this, this first one. Um, all right, so when I break this down, I'm looking at two different types of functions. I'm looking at an outside function here, which is my natural log, and then I'm looking at an inside function, which is my two times x to the 10th. Um, and so since I have an outside function and inside function, we're going to use chain rule for this one, um, which means the first thing I have to do is I have to take the derivative of my outside function. All right, so the derivative of natural log we saw last time was 1 over x. x is our input, so it's really 1 over, you know, whatever our input is. And for chain rule, um, our input, we're going to leave this 2x to the 10th alone, right? So this is our if we're thinking about this in the terms of our, our chain rule, this would be our f prime, right? That would be our one over x, and then we're leaving g of x alone on the inside. And then what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to multiply all of this by the derivative of our inside function. So the derivative of two x to the 10th, um, we're gonna use power rule. So two times 10 is 20, and then we're gonna reduce our exponent by one. So you get this um, one over two x to the 10th, times 20x to the ninth. And um, if we wanted to, we could go ahead and we could simplify this. And so I'm gonna just erase this. Um, we don't have to simplify, but sometimes it's, it's nice to do that. Um, so the x to the 10th and the x to the ninth, that becomes a, you're gonna get an x in the denominator, then 20 over two is, is 10. So simplifying this all down, we get 10 over x. Um, as I mentioned before, if you left it without the simplification, if you feel like this in web work, um, that would be, that should be sufficient as well. Okay. All right, so how did that feel for everybody in the, that's here? That one was okay? Yeah, lots of thumbs up. Um, all right, did anybody have any ideas on this one? What do we do with, we have something a little bit different here, right? So we're changing the base of our logarithm. The base over here is e, and now the base over here is three. Um, so how does that how does that change things? Does anybody have any ideas for this one? Yeah, exactly, right? So the way Emily put it was, you have to put the you have to do the change of base formula which is exactly right. And so what I'm gonna do, if we don't remember that from, uh, from pre-calculus, let's go ahead and let's just take a quick look at what that change of base formula is. Okay, so with logarithms, you can turn the base into anything that you want. And so often we always come back to natural log as a, as a common base that we use for everything. Um, and so one of the, um, versions of the change of base formula is this right here. So anytime you have um, a different base, if you have, you know, in our case, we had base three, we can rewrite it as natural log, right? So instead of having log base threes, we can turn them into natural logs by um, taking the natural log of our input and dividing by the natural log of our base here. Okay, so in our case, we have log base three and then this natural log of x over natural log of three is the same expression through our change of base formula. 
All right, so what we're gonna do when we go back to the other problem, we're gonna take log base three and we're gonna rewrite it like this, okay, as natural log of our input divided by natural log of three. Um, and it's gonna be helpful, I think, to view it this way, right? So this one over natural log of three that comes out, out front, I just wanna point out that this is gonna act like a constant. Okay, so there's no input over here. So this is just a number. So when we go and we take the derivative of log base three, this is a constant. So this gets to come along for free. It goes along with our constant multiple rule. And then we're back to just looking at a natural log problem. Okay, so we're gonna come back to the previous slide and take a look at, at this one, okay? So, what I'm gonna do is I can rewrite this just like we saw on the other screen as one over natural log of three times natural log of two X plus five. Okay, so um, I'm not using my equal sign appropriately here. Um, so I should say that this is the same as taking the derivative of this function, okay? So I use a change of base formula to rewrite it. And when I take this derivative, I'm gonna get this one over natural log of three to pop out. And now we're back in the same case before where we're taking the derivative of a natural log function, which is gonna be very similar to what we did over here. Okay, so um, when I take this, I would get one over two X plus five. And then the derivative of two X plus five is just two, okay? So if we wanted to put this all together, you could leave it like this, um, but if we put it in one fraction, it would look something like this. One over natural log of three times two X plus five, okay? And so anytime that we have uh, a different base logarithm, so it doesn't matter what the base is, um, we can go through the same process. So Everything is pretty much going to be the same as the natural log, except you're, you're going to get this one additional constant that comes out with it, right? So you, it looks just like we did for natural log over here, but then you're going to get this one additional uh, constant. So if we want to, um, we can go ahead and we could make a new rule. We could say, Hey, the derivative of log base b of x is going to be 1 over natural log of b times x. Okay, so anytime that you have a different base, this is a, a general rule that you can use. Okay, so I'm going to pause here for a second and see if we have, if we have any questions about this or about what we did over here. Um, could you do it instead of log base 10? So um, if you do log base 10 for this, um, these would all be 10s, okay? So you could do a log base 10, but you're gonna get additional stuff that pops into this. So I just wanna, um, uh, let's take a moment and just let's think through what happens in a specific example if this is log base e of x, okay? And so when we say log base e, really what this is is natural log, right? So we use this notation ln to mean log base e, okay? So we use log base e because what happens over here on the right-hand side is we're gonna get one over natural log of E times X. And natural log of E, right, this right here, natural log of E is equal to one. Okay, so it's just particularly nice, things work out particularly nicely when you have log base E, right? So things drop out and then you're not gonna have an additional constant in there. Um, if you do log base 10, it's gonna work out. Your, the answers will end up being the same, but algebraically, I think they're gonna be a little bit more complicated because you have that, you're gonna have um, a constant down here that's not one, right? So there'll just be something else that, that's in there, log base, natural log of 10.
So far, so good. Uh, so we get some thumbs up, some feedback, other questions. Amber, it's good. All right, so uh, what we wanna do is we wanna start thinking now about these inverse trig functions. So um, in my experience, usually when we think about arc sine and when we think about arc tangent, a lot of people aren't very familiar with those, right? So maybe sine, cosine, tangent seem to be a little bit more familiar, but when we move on to the inverse trig functions, eh, maybe we're not so familiar with those. So how do we feel? Is that the same here? Do we, are we familiar with inverse trig functions? Are we, do we not know what they are? What do we think? Not sure. Okay. All right. So I prepared a like a slide over here. We can talk about uh, inverse trig functions um, a little bit. Okay. So we're going to use this new notation. So we're going to have a new function that's called arc sine. Okay. So um, the way that we write arc sine is we would look at a function like this. So we say a r c s i n x okay so um, we put that arc up in front and then this is saying this is the inverse function for sine it undoes whatever sine is doing to its inputs this thing undoes it okay and specifically the sine function is not uh is not one-to-one -one. so what we can do is let me bring up i'm going to bring up a desmos window here as well um and we'll flip over to that in a second. But um, what we, if you graph the sine function, which I'll show, it isn't one to one, so it's not invertible over this whole domain. So if you were to reflect it, if you were to reflect it over line y equals x, you wouldn't get a function anymore. It wouldn't pass the vertical line test. So um, what we have to do is we have to restrict our domain so that um, we are, in fact, a one to one function. And so there's lots of different domains that you could restrict over, but we have all agreed as mathematicians that we're going to use this one, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Um, and so this ends up, when you think about the unit circle, it's either quadrant 1 or quadrant 4, right? So negative, negative pi over 2 is down here, and then pi over 2 is up here. And so you're restricting yourself to sort of this part of the, of the unit circle. Okay. And something that's going to be particularly important for us is how do we define um, and how do we use arc sine. And so this right here is particularly important, right? So if you have y equals arc sine of x, um, then you have x equals sine of y. So this is the general inverse property. So when we say two functions are inverses, this is what we mean in general. Okay. So we mean that what I can do is if I compose them, they undo each other or um, uh, how do we say this? So if I have an input to my arc sine function and I wanna know what the output is, that's the same thing as swapping outputs and inputs. So whatever this output should be, I ask myself, hey, what would I have to plug into sine to get that as an output, okay? so. If I ask myself, hey, what is arc sine of one half? We ask ourselves, hey, what is the number that we have to plug in to sine to get one half? Okay, so if I if I ask this question, so we'll, I mean, we know we have we see what the answer is here. But let's do it with a little question mark. I think this might be helpful, right? So if I'm looking at this question, I want to know. What is arc sine of one half? Right? What is the value that's going to pop out of that? The question then becomes, well, sine of what is equal to one half, right? Sine of what input is equal to one half. And we just have to make sure that that input is somewhere between negative pi over two and pi over two. Okay, so what we would do is we would look at this here. And so in our particular case that we that we looked at here for one half, the answer to that question is um, is pi over six. Okay. 
And so sometimes you want to think about it with these words down here, arc sine, this is an angle, right? So sine is going to take angles as inputs and then it's going to output y coordinates on the unit circle. Um, and so you can think about it this way, arc sine is the angle that produces whatever you want, right? So this is going to be the angle that you plug into sine in order to get this as an output. Okay, so let's flip over to, to Desmos really quickly here. Um, and so um, let's look at our function sine x, okay? So when we say it's not one-to-one, -one, what we're saying is if I have a horizontal line, okay? So if I look at a horizontal line here, you can see that it, that it hits our function in multiple places. So we want to cut off our, our domain so that it only hits the graph in exactly one point. And so with our sine function, the, the smallest possible output is negative one, and the largest possible output is one. So what we want to do is we want to represent all of those outputs in some interval, and um, we want to cut it off so that a horizontal line only meets it in one spot. And so the way that we can do that is we can write this as negative pi over two, is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to pi over two, right? So we're gonna restrict our attention. We're gonna take the sine function and then we're gonna look at it this way, okay? So what we wanna do now is check, hey, there's, if I take any horizontal line, it only hits this at one spot. And in order to think about the arc sine function, what we would do is I would reflect this across the line y equals x. So if we look at arc sine, we can see that the arc sine function takes this red graph and then just reflects it across the, the x-axis like this. So our domain here, right, is negative pi over two um, to pi over two. All right, so this is the this is sort of just a, a crash course on what is the what is the arc sine function, right? But um, the important thing to note is if you put them together, right? What you get is the identity function, right? So they undo each other. Whatever I plug in here, provided it's in the domain of arc sine, this is going to remain unchanged. Right, so they're, they're inverse functions. Okay, um, all right, so, so what we're gonna see is how do I take the derivative of such a function, right? If I wanted to go ahead and take the derivative of this thing, we're gonna use this inverse property to our advantage much in the same way that we did um, that we did with natural log, okay? So what I'm gonna do um, is I'm gonna walk through the derivative of arc sine, and then I'm gonna have you all think about this and go through the derivative of arc tangent, okay? So we're gonna have a function, we're gonna call it h of x, okay? So this is also written out in the book, I think it's complicated enough that I'm also gonna go through it here. Um, but if you're going back and reading in the book, you'll see this as well. Okay, so we're gonna have a function h of x equals arc sine of x. And um, we have this question that's gonna be in the back of our mind, which is what is h prime of x? Okay, so as we go through this process, we're gonna be thinking and saying, hey, I wanna find h prime. So when we take some derivatives, um, we really want to keep that in mind, okay? So anytime we see h prime of x, that's really of interest to us because h prime is representing the derivative of arc sine, okay? So if we can do some fancy stuff and then we can come out in the end and solve for h prime, that's gonna be really good for us. Okay, so step one here is to use that inverse property. Okay, so the inverse property 
if we take a step back, is this right here. Okay, so um, what I can do is I can, I say if, if y is equal to arc sine, which is what we have over here, h of x is equal to arc sine, then x has to be equal to sine of y. Okay, so we can rewrite this and say that um, we could have sine of h of x is equal to x. Okay, so what we did is we used that inverse property to rewrite this. And now um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about, hey, taking the derivative of this expression. So I'm going to take the derivative of what's on the left, and I'm also going to take the derivative of what's on the right. Okay, so on the left, we're going to use chain rule. So we're going to get the derivative of our outside function is cosine of h of x. And then I have to multiply by the derivative of my inside function, which is h prime of x. And all of this is going to be equal to 1. Right? And uh, all right, so again, what we said is, hey, we're really interested in this h prime. So that's right here. And what we could do is we could solve for that, right? So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna divide both sides of this by cosine x. So I'll get h prime of x is equal to one over cosine of h of x, which is equal to one over cosine of arc sine of x. Okay, so this is a perfectly reasonable way to think about the derivative of arc sine. Um, but um, it looks a little bit messy, right? So this, what we're going to see now, is sort of one of the um, cooler things, in my opinion, that we that we do in um, in calculus, because we're going to see that we can get rid of all of this messiness, right? So there's a cosine in here. There's this arc sine. I know a lot of us weren't even familiar with this function like 15 minutes ago, and now it's appearing again in the derivative. Um, so we're going to say, hey, can we, can we get rid of this? Can we simplify somehow and make our lives easier? Okay, so we have this. I'm going gonna, gonna to bring this up here. And now we have to think about, hey, what is, what are the meaning of all these things? Okay. So arc sine of x, okay? So this is an angle, okay? So oftentimes we use theta for arc sine of x. Um, and this is the angle, okay, that we have to plug into sine to get x, okay? What angle do we have to plug in the sine in order to get x? So if we go back and we think about our triangle trigonometry, oftentimes we drew pictures that looked like this. Okay, so we had a little angle here, and we had a right triangle. And we said, hey, I want this angle to be such that sine of this angle is equal to x. I want sine of theta be equal to x. So how many of us remember, uh, so Riley says, can we, all right, I got some questions here. Um, so you cannot write arc sine as negative sine now. Um, so we'll go through some alternate notations here in a minute. But um, and I have a, another question from Caitlin says, why one? So Caitlin, your question was this one right here, are you saying why is this a one? So uh, the derivative of x, you can think about this as, um, if we want to, we can write this as um, x to the first power. All right, so you could think about this as, as power rule. And so you're going to get 1 times x to the 0, which is equal to 1. All right, so this is one way that we could potentially think about it. 
Yeah, or I mean, another way to think about it is it's a linear function that has slope one. And so anytime you take the derivative of a, of a linear function, it's gonna have slope one. Um, and so, so Riley, I'm gonna, we'll talk about alternate notations um, here in a little bit. Okay, so, so back to this, we wanna try and simplify, right? So we have this sort of triangle over here and I'm asking myself, hey, sine, I wanna pick theta so that sine of theta is equal to x. And what that amounts to is I need to sort of fill in what are the what are the different side lengths of this of this triangle. Okay, so so I'm gonna go ahead and and clean this up a bit. So we're gonna keep this in mind, but sine we want sine of theta to be x, and we're gonna have to put in different values on this triangle. Um, so one of the things that you may remember is this. This one's pretty good for us. Sakatawa. What do we think? Sakatawa is good. Okay, so what this tells us is sine, what I need is if I look at this, if I have the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse, I want that to be x. Okay, so the easiest way for me to do this is I'm gonna take my opposite side divided by my, my hypotenuse, that should be x. And so one way to do that is if I call this side x and if I call this side one. Okay, so in this case, in this triangle, if I do sine of theta, Right, so this tells me sine of theta is equal to x over one, which is exactly what I want, right? So I want theta to be arc sine of x, and so that means sine of theta is equal to x. So this triangle right here is, is satisfying my, my conditions, okay? But now, if we take a step back, one of the things we can do is we have over here, we have that h prime of x is one over cosine of arc sine, which is really one over cosine of this theta that we talked about, okay? So in this triangle now, what I can do is I look at this and I say, hey, well, what is cosine of theta? What is cosine of this angle? Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So I need to figure out what is the length of this side right here, okay? And so what we can do is if we, if we take a little detour with this triangle, okay, um, what we get is we, we could call this say, um, we could call this A. So you get A squared plus X squared is equal to one squared. Right, so this is the Pythagorean theorem. And when I break this down, I would get A is equal to one minus X squared, right? So A squared is equal to one minus X squared. And so A is equal to the square root of one minus X squared, so like this. And so what we get, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, erase this here and what we can put down here is this is the square root of one minus x squared okay and we'll come back all right so now cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse so cosine of theta is just this divided by one and so what we get is that our derivative h prime of x is really equal to one over the square root of one minus x squared. Okay, so we have we have all of our all of our stuff here. So if I I'm gonna try to do this and put it all on the screen. So this is sort of our, our workboard for figuring out hey, what is the derivative of arc sine? And to me, this is really profoundly amazing. So 
we have this, this function that we introduced today. It is the inverse sine function, right? So we have this sine function, it's this trigonometric function. We're taking its inverse, and then we're taking the derivative of it. And there's all this complicated stuff that's happening. And what comes out at the end is, has nothing to do with trigonometry at all, right? There's no cosines or sines or tangent. There's no, there's no trigonometry in this answer, right? So you took the derivative of this new crazy function, arc sine, and what pops out is no trigonometry. There's nothing. There's no, it's just x's, right? Things that we understand, right? So we have, we have square roots and, and squares. Um, so uh, to me, this is really, really pretty, pretty neat. Uh, and so what I'll do is, is we'll put it on a, another slide and, and we'll put it like as a rule. Um, and so if we want to add this to our, our list of rules, the derivative of arc sine of x is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, so, so really quite, quite something. Would you be able to type out how that looks with the square root like that for demos, just for our notes? Oh, for web work. How to, how would you do this in web work? Um, so in web work, if you want to, let's see if we can, if I can bring one up here. So I'll bring up a, I'll bring up web work and see if we have a, So, um, so yeah, so, so Riley, that's exactly right. That's how you would write it in web work. Um, so we can do, we'll do a web work. I'll do a web work example on web work here for us. Um, but to go back to Riley's question, we had a, an alternate notation for inverse sine. Um, and so sometimes um, what we see is we see arc sine is written this way. We see arc sine of X, um, some people write it this way, sine inverse of x. Okay, so this is sine to the negative one. Um, now it's 50-50, so I'm going to clean this up a little bit. It's 50-50 depending on who's writing it, which one you're going to see. Um, and so on web work, sometimes it's going to say arc sine, sometimes it's going to say sine inverse, like this. Um, for me personally, I think this notation is um, is better because this has the same issue with exponents. So um, a lot of the time people get this confused with one over sine, right? So like being the negative one power there, we just talked about exponent rules where a negative exponent means one over or the reciprocal. Um, and so that can be confusing. So the alternate notation for this if we want to, it is, um, we could say the derivative of sine inverse of x is also one over the square root of one minus x squared. So you're gonna see it, you're gonna see it both ways. You're gonna see it as arc sine, you're also gonna see it as sine, sine inverse, okay? Okay, so, um, so yeah, let's jump over to, to web work, and so I'll I'm going to think through um, this first web work problem. Okay. All right, can we see this? Okay. Excellent. All right, so there's a note down here at the bottom, right? So it will accept either arc sine of x or sine to the negative one sine inverse. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna write it like this, arc sine of x. I think messing with exponents is just a little more difficult than writing A or C S I N. Okay, so, so we have a, we have a problem here. We're gonna think about it. So, um, I'll give you all a moment to, to think about this. So this is web work. 
homework one. So um, what I'll do is I'll work this out on the Blackboard um, and then we'll come back and we'll see how we can input this into, into web work. Okay. Um, so we have this, I copied the problem down and we'll jump back to our, our Blackboard. Okay, so we have this five sine inverse of x squared and we want to take the derivative. Um, so the first thing that I'm gonna do is when I take this derivative, uh, I observe that we have a constant that's hanging out out front, right, to so this five. That's not really a challenge to me. Um, I'm going to just, I'm just going to bring that down for free and Oops. Um, so I get a five. And then what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to have to multiply that by the derivative of this sine inverse of x squared. So as I'm going along, that five, I've already, I've already dispatched that. I'm not really thinking about that anymore. My focus has shifted to this sine inverse of x squared. Okay. So a little more space. Um, okay, so from our rules, what I'm noticing with this function is there are two things. There's this sine inverse, but then there's also something else on the inside. So this is a chain rule problem, right? So we have this new rule for sine inverse. Also, we see a chain rule in here, right? So we get this x squared. And um, so I'm going to need to look at my outside function. I'm going to have to take care of that and then use chain rule to multiply the derivative of my inside function. So we have five times. Um, so the derivative of sine inverse or arc sine was one over, okay, so it was one over the square root of one minus whatever my input was squared. Okay, and so in this case, our blue, Right, so our blue, this is our inside function, which is our input, so that's gonna be x squared. And then I have to go ahead and I have to multiply by the derivative of this, which is derivative of x squared is 2x. Okay, and so when we break this all down, the five is my constant that came out, out front. Um, this is, my f prime of g of x in chain rule, and then this is my g prime of x. Okay, so again, um, the notation here is where we're, we're abusing our notation, but that's, that's okay. I just wanna illustrate sort of where the different pieces are. So this is the derivative of x squared, that's our g prime of x in chain rule, and this is our f prime of, of g of x. So I'll go ahead and get rid of this. Okay, so if we want to copy this down, this is our, our derivative. We've done this work on our paper, and we're going to jump back over and see how do we, how are we going to type this into, into web work. So um, let's go back over there. All right, so we had a five. And then we wanted to multiply that by um, this expression. Okay, so we had um, one over the square root. So SQRT is gonna be is gonna be what we use for square root of one minus x, right? We can think about it this way, x squared squared. I'm just gonna write it just like we had it. And then I'm gonna multiply all of that by two x. Okay, so all I did is I just typed everything in and I'm not sure right away whether this is going to be the right thing. So before I submit anything, I'm gonna go ahead and preview my answers and see what that looks like. Okay, so I haven't submitted anything. I haven't checked anything yet. 
um, all I've done is I typed this in and then I'm gonna look and see what, what that is, what web work is seeing. And so if I compare that to what I had before, um, that looks pretty good to me, right? So I have a five um, and I have my one over square root of one minus X squared squared times two X. And so we can go ahead and, and submit and then Wilberg tells us that, that that is in fact correct. Okay, so, um, so we can see the, this has been a common question for a lot of us, right? How do I type square roots into web work? Um, so this is one way to do it. Um, and so sometimes it's nice because then you don't have to mess with exponents. Um, so another way that we could do that is um, we could have put this to the one half power, but I'm gonna have to add in some parentheses. So if I preview, right, we would get something like this. Um, and if I submit, it's gonna tell me I'm correct anyway. So square roots are generally either raised to the one half power or SQRT um, will give you that square root symbol. Um, so either one of these is gonna be, is gonna be okay. So questions, comments, concerns so far? So the test, um, so we have stopped the cover section 2.7. Um, and so we'll do that, I think Monday and Wednesday. And so once we're done with section 2.7, I'll open the exam up and then you'll have a week to do it. So it's not gonna be on a particular day. You're gonna have um, a whole week. It'll, the exam will be open for a week, um, meaning, any time during that week, you can take the exam, but you have to have a, you'll have to have a two hour time block set aside. So once you start the exam, um, you have two hours from when you start it to when you have to finish it, but you could take it any time during the week, right? So if you wanted to take it on a Saturday, if you wanted to take it in the evening or in the morning, everybody can take it at a separate time. Um, but you have to take it in a consecutive two hour block. Um, yeah, if you need more time on the web work, um, we're, you are all welcome to have more time on these things, yeah. So this one, um, so the chain rule I think we'd be pretty good with, we just started this inverse trigonometry today. Um, so there's nine, there's nine questions, so not too many. Um, so I would say try to try to do them. I mean, what we would do on Monday, we might revisit some of this. So if we want, if you want me to push it back, I can do that. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to give people more time. Anytime you want more time on any of this. So other questions you, well, we have, we have a few more minutes. So, um, so, hmm. Right, okay. All right, so we haven't talked about arc tangent yet. So, so yeah, so we're gonna go ahead and, and I'll, move, I'll move that web work, the inverse trigonometry web work back into next week. So we have more time. Um, but that'll give us some time to think about, to think through arc tangent um, on, on Monday. All right, so if you, you see some of these down here we have we have lots of arc tangents in there yeah so we'll need some time to, to think about that so we'll, we'll push it back um with the last three minutes though let's go ahead and and uh and let's think through this one so this one just has an arc sign um just so we can use our time here so 2.6.4 b i'll go ahead and write this down is we have our function p to the t is two raised to the t arc sine 
T. Okay. So let's go back. Yeah. So while we have this, let's do let's do one more example and then we'll we'll call it a, a weekend. All right, so let's go through this. Um, again, we see when I look up here at my function t times arc sine of t, we're going to have a chain rule. Um, so I have my outside function, which is two to something. And then inside of this, we have a, a product rule. And then we have our derivative of our new arc sine in here. So there's lots going on, um, but we'll go ahead and, and break it down for us. So p prime of t. What we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative of the outside function, which is 2 to the something times natural log of 2. Okay, so we're going to have this, and I'm going to have to leave that inside function alone. So that inside function is t to the arc sine of t. So I'm doing chain rule, and what I have to do is I have to multiply by the derivative um, of this t times arc sine of t. Okay, so this is my chain rule piece. So we've gone ahead and we've done chain rule. And now what we want to do is we're going to use product rule. So I have 2 to the t arc sine of t times natural log of 2. And in order to take this derivative, um, I'm going to multiply by a lot of stuff, but we get four pieces, right? So we're going to have four pieces here, see if we can give ourselves a little bit more space. And I'm gonna have my first function, which is just t times the derivative of arc sine, which is one over the square root of one minus t squared, plus the derivative of t, which is just one. And then what we're gonna have here in our last spot, I didn't use my space that, well, in our last spot here, we're going to have arc sine of t. And then I'll resize this here for us so we can see everything together. Okay. So um, what we see is the first thing that we did is we use over here, right? So this is this is part of our chain rule, right? And then we have, this is the derivative of our inside function. And inside of that, right, we have our, we have our four pieces here, which is our product rule. Okay, so, so lots going on. Um, but we can put all the pieces together, and now we have this new function in there, which is uh, arc sine, right? And we have a rule for its derivative. Um, so one more example to, to close out the weekend. But um, so as people are asking, yeah, I'll push back um, once we once we close out here. Um, I'll go ahead and, and push the due date for the um, for the inverse trigonometry. Okay. Um, all right, so any more questions before we sign off? Some people have been asking, asking questions as we go. But. All right, well, if there's nothing else, so um, I'm going to call it here, but you can always email me. Um, so have a great weekend, everybody, and I'll see you, I'll see you next week on Monday. Stay safe, stay happy. See ya.